just want to read the scriptures before we go any further. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 to 11. One of the most well-known, well-remembered, well-rehearsed, well-spoken again and again, proclaimed, talked about, declared scriptures. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Now, this scripture starts with therefore. And whenever there is the word therefore, that means there is a story behind it. And that's the story behind is what we are going to look at today. Now, how was your Christmas, by the way? I forgot to ask. Did everyone enjoy your Christmas? Yes. yes. Yeah? Was it good? Yes. yes. Lot, of, lot of gifts. You know, gifts is the best part of Christmas. You know, when you're unwrapping the present and there's climax and there's that, you know, excitement building up and stuff. What's going to be inside? And then you find something that's very nice. Sometimes it's not what you expected, but we all enjoy opening our presents. Now, I just want to touch a little bit about Christmas because we are still sort of in this festive season. The thing that I want to talk about Christmas is the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to ask you this question. Do you think that it was a mere coincidence the way Jesus was born? No? One person thinks it's no. Do you think that God suddenly ran out of miracles on Christmas Day or on the birth when Jesus Christ was born? And he forgot that he had to do a miracle for Mary and Joseph to get them a room inside the inn. No. Okay. <clears throat> do you think that if Jesus would have been born in a nice middle class family, in a good place, in a hospital, or, or at least with a midwife, a qualified nurse, you know, to assist the birth of Christ, would he still have died on the cross for your sins and for my sins and rose again? Think about it. Would he still have done that? Have you ever thought about it? Would he still have been the savior of the world if he wasn't born the way he was born? If he wasn't born in a manger, if he wasn't born in Bethlehem, if he wasn't born among the animals, if he wasn't born in those dire conditions, would he still have saved you and me? Is that possible? Yes. That is possible, right? So it isn't a mere coincidence that God shows that particular way Jesus was born. Right? So if he chose that particular way, if there was a plan all along that Jesus would be born in a manger, then we must understand why. Right? You with me? Yes. Right? So if you say Amen, you're with me. If you don't say anything, you're deciding. And uh, you know, if you shake your head, then that means you're saying yes in an Indian way. Okay? <laughs> so I'll, I'll look for some signals from you. So Jesus would have still been the Savior. Yet God sent him and designed and planned this. And somehow Mary would have been saying perhaps, or maybe she didn't say, I'm just saying it. Where's that angel who brought the good news to me? Where is he now? Come on, there's no room in the inn. We've been asked to just go in, in the stable with the animals and, and there is no comfy bed or anything at all. See, these two things about, and we've got some pictures that we're going to show in a moment, is what I just want to pick on lightly. Manger and Bethlehem. One famous carol that we, we sing along on Christmas a lot and you hear them on the streets as well sometimes, away in a manger, puts it really well. Away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay, 
the little Lord Jesus asleep on hay. You know, this, these words are quite humbling words. That your Savior and my Savior, the one who died on the cross, the one who put those stars in the sky in the first place, is now being guided by a star. These are incredibly humble words, yet God decided just that Jesus would be born that way. What is a manger? You might have seen a picture of a manger that somehow looks like this on, on Christmas cards sometimes you see and it's, it looks a little bit comfortable, you know. And, but in reality, it is, it is much worse. That's a, that's a typical depiction of a manger. You know, snugged up with some, with some duvet or whatever, blanket. I don't think that was the case. But this is a real manger. This is from the, the archaeological facts. That, that's how it would have been in the original. So basically, a place where the, the cows and the horses or the donkeys or the mules or whatever would come and eat from it. It's a feeding tray. It's a feeding trough. For the animals. And your Savior and my Savior laid in that place. Is that a coincidence? If it isn't, then what does it mean for you and for me? What does it mean? What can we learn from this story of the manger? What can we learn from the town Bethlehem? Currently it is it is under Palestine. What can we learn from this town called Bethlehem? Micah prophesied about it. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, too little. He said, you're too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one shall come forth for me who is to be the ruler in Israel. His goings forth appearances are from long ago, from ancient days. You see, I live, from, uh, live in Walthamstow and you know, we are all proud of the areas we live in. You know, everybody who lives in Walthamstow, shout hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel the same way, that's all right. I don't blame you with the recent upgrades to Walthamstow, I don't You know, but Pastor Mike lives in central London and there are no arguments about central London. Come right by Vincent Square, millions of pounds of properties. We are sometimes proud of the place we come from. Yes, I'm from Uganda. The best Sima is from Uganda or Ugali, you know. Whereas the Kenyans might say, no, 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 no. My brother, you must come. You must come to Kenya and try it. But Stephen himself has been to Malawi and he's understood that Malawians make the best Sima, you know. So we are all proud of the place we come from, you know. One day we were having a dinner and uh, we are discussing and in our home group and it was a social event and we were talking about biryani and we said, you know, Lahori makes the best biryani and, and uh, uh, Michelle was saying, you know, Karachi, they are the ones, you know, the school of biryani and all that stuff. And somebody said, no, 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 no. Indians, they, they've got biryani as well. What we discovered that it's neither Indian nor Pakistani, it's a Persian dish. <laughs> and we are claiming reward for making it in the best possible way. So sometimes we are proud of the place we come from, right? Jesus couldn't have been proud of the place he came because it was too little. If in today's culture and society and day and age we are proud of the place we come from or the countries we visit, I like Pastor Mike was like talking about Scotland, the Highlands, you know, um, they, 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 according to him they're not better than England but uh, you know you go there you think they yeah. are. Um, we are proud of these places. The sea by which we live. Jesus would not have been proud of the town where he was born because it was too little to be even counted among the clans of Judah. Yet God sent him there. Come on, at least you should have chosen Jerusalem. You know, why not Jerusalem? Why not any other place? Why Bethlehem? Why the least? What is God trying to teach me from this story of birth? What is the point, Lord? Are you trying to say that, well, do not despise the humble beginnings? Are you trying to say that it doesn't matter where you start, but what matters is where you end? But what is it, Lord, that you're trying to teach me from this small 
details of this birth of Lord Jesus Christ in this humble place? What is it that I can take away and apply in my life? What is it that I can learn from those carols? Even there's a carol about Bethlehem. What is it, Lord, that you want me to learn? But if I could tell you one thing that the Lord really wants us to learn, it's one simple word. You ready? One percent of you are. Are you ready? Yes. It's a very simple word. And the essence of that word has already been preached in pastoral and what Pastor Mike shared is humility. Humility. Turn to somebody next to you and in a very humble way <laughs> say to them, humility. Your humility is a word <clears throat> that is extremely misunderstood. And I, I really, when I started putting this message down what the Lord gave it to me, I realized that I've misunderstood humility. I've, I've never really comprehended exactly what humility is. So often, we confuse humility. Do you know that this is a gift of the Holy Spirit? Yeah? Amen? Wrong. It is not. So all of those who said amen, you need to pay attention to your Bibles. You better switch them on now. It is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not listed. And I also said gift. That's another thing that Pastor Mike just picked on. It isn't a fruit of the Holy Spirit either. It isn't listed there. What is listed there is gentleness. And if you can find any translation saying word humility, I'll give you five points now. Right now. <laughs> Too small to read your Bible for five points. One verse only, Galatians 5, 22 to 23, two verses. But the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our hearts and that's in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Only one Bible, which is a very bad translation called Good News Bible, translates this word as humility. Apart from that, no other Bible does. And self-control. There is no law against these things. It isn't listed as a fruit of the Spirit and there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it and I'll come on to that reason why that it isn't a fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is quite remarkable. Why could it not be a fruit of the Holy Spirit? Think about it. Why could God not have squeezed in or are you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Oh, you're going to have some, as one of the fruits, you're going to have humility as well. But gentleness is part of humility, but it is not in its entirety humbleness. It is something more and so often we confuse gentleness, kindness, Politeness, being nice to others, being polite to others is humility. You know, if that was the case, English people will be the most humble people on earth. Because they are extremely polite, at least to your face. You know, <laughs> but uh, you know, they say, oh, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry, did I, did I hit you? No, you didn't, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, trust me, Scottish people are even more polite. Not if you are a football fan. Um, we confuse humbleness. We think that it is humbling for me to preach. If I'm preaching the word of God, that's a sign of humility. It is not. It's my job as a pastor. We think Mick is a deacon and, and, and he's a deacon, so he's doing his deacon duties. That's humility. Well, humility might have got him there, but that's not. What you do as your job, whether higher or lower, is not humility. If you work as a cleaner, you work as a cleaner. That's not humility. If you work as a waiter in a restaurant, you serve on the tables, that's your job, that's not humility. We confuse, we see sometimes someone in a very low place, someone who by choice are homeless, well, they're very humble people. No, they're not. 
My friend in congregation, he got hurt by one of them. We confuse what humbleness really is. Christ himself clarified these two words in one scripture. The Greek word for, for gentleness mentioned in, in Galatians is praus, which is translated throughout the New Testament as mildness, meekness, gentleness. That's the word for gentleness. But the word for humbleness is tapinos, which is translated as humbleness. And this is what it means biblically. Dismissing reliance upon self-government and empty carnal ego. Amen. It got nothing to do with what job you do. But I'll come on to that in a minute. Humility will exalt the Lord as our all in all and prompts the gift of his fullness in us. A classic example is what Pastor Mike exactly said about John the Baptist. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. When I'm able to empty myself of what I think, what my needs are, what I need to have in my life and focus and put God first in my life and the needs of the others, that's what humility is. Amen. Not just being polite and nice to people. Not just being doing what you are asked to do. But it is doing what you are not even asked to do because there is a need. Did you hear that? It isn't doing what you are asked to do, but it is doing what you are not even asked to do because you saw a need in the kingdom of God. That is true humility in its full form. But so often we are empty of humility and so full of selfies. I won't say any more word on that. Selfies. Matthew 11 verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me as my disciple. For I am gentle, proud, and humble, tapinos in heart. And you will find rest and you will bless it quite for your souls. Jesus himself said that I am gentle. Yes, we've got to be gentle. We've got to be polite. We've got to be nice. But moreover, we need to have that humility in our hearts. The humbleness I'm talking about is more than just being polite and gentle in our speech and actions. Humility is more than just an attitude towards others. Rather, it is a lifestyle by which we live. It is achieved by totally being sold out for the kingdom of God and giving up who you are and letting God's reflection take its full place in our lives. Amen? Amen. That is the message of the birth of Christ. What we think so often and we limit humbleness and confuse it with gentleness. We think humble people don't shout. That's common understanding of my people. We think humble people don't get angry. We think humble people just do whatever they are asked to do. We think humbleness is about being nice to others and acting in kindness towards others, not offending anyone. We think humbleness means we must obey others at all times. Doesn't matter whether you like it or not, that's not humility because if you don't like it and you do it, that's not humility. A true humbleness would allow you to like everything that you are asked to do. Amen? True humbleness would allow you to love everything that you are asked to do. No matter how low, no matter how below your position it may be. You won't do it whether I like it or I don't like it, I'm just going to do it because I'm, I'm an obedient person. That's not humility. That's just obedience or fear or whatever the wrong motive there may be. To really understand humility, we need to understand just one simple passage. And that's in Philippians chapter 2. We are starting off. Therefore, what happened before that therefore? For me, it defines exactly what humility and humbleness is. 
just condensed into this small story that we so often read but never really ponder and reflect and understand it word by word. And it says in, in verse 3 and 4, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. In other words, don't show off. Be humble, Tapinos, be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourself. Don't look only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Can you hear these words echoing in your soul? Can you see the Holy Spirit speaking to each and every one of us? It says don't be selfish. That it isn't about you. It isn't about what you can take so often. And I know it and I've spoken to people and I've tried to convince them of this. So often people would say, well, you know, I worshipped in the church, but I didn't get anything out of it today. But I'm sorry. I didn't know that everybody gathered to worship you. I thought we were gathered to worship God. We think, what, what did I take from the church today? What did you bring to the church today? What did you bring to the throne room of God today? Well, I'm not feeling that song. The guitar's been off there. Harun, come on, practice man. Now he's very good, man. It's a wrong example. Luke, now he's very good as well. I don't know, not that. This is sometimes, well, I'm not feeling the spirit of God today. It's not about you feeling the spirit, it's about me. Lifting my hands, falling on my knees, and lifting King Jesus, that he may draw all men unto him. Amen. Amen? It isn't about what I can take away from this place. Yes, God will give me whatever he wants to give me, and he will do that. But I don't come with that motive. I don't enter in this place because I want to be blessed. I enter in this place because I want to bless the Lord Almighty. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the attitude. We treat this as a show. Yeah, in some places, in some, I've been to some conferences, like, you know, do you just feel how much you've been blessed today and then give? Whether I've been blessed or not, I'm going to give. Yes. Right? Yes. I'm going to give. It doesn't matter how the sermon goes. It does not matter who the preacher was. It does not matter how the worship was. I'm going to give unto the king. Because that's what I'm here for. To give, to worship the Lord, the king of kings. Amen. So often we are so selfish in what we do. What's in it for me? What am I going to get out of the end of it? Classic example, airport drop-offs. You know, I dropped you, you make sure I'm mean, going call you, will you drop me as well? You know, I stood for that. People don't want to drop you because you never go abroad. <laughs> so there's, it's not a good investment. You know, I drop everyone because I grow abroad a lot and Pastor Mike doesn't drop anyone. Or doesn't ask because he can take the train. Um, that's what he normally does, you know. So often we've traveled and uh, I've, I've come on the car and stayed on the train. Um, people who generally want to do something to you because they're going to get something out of it. We just had Christmas. I can, not bad, but I can, I can say honestly that some people would give because they know they're going to get a good gift in that time. Did you say amen? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wake this guy. Um, <laughs> You must have done that to Florence. <laughs> but that's the attitude, right? You know, what am I going to take to their home? Because, you know, if I take something nice, they're going to bring something. Well, they only give me chocolate, so I'm only going to give them chocolate. That's the standard. You measure. Sometimes you wait. Did they give me something Christmas? I'll wait till the 25th. 26th. Oh, sorry, I forgot your present, by the way. And so also sometimes it's past the parcel. You get from one place, you pass it to the other place. Because you don't need it. That's the type of things. But you know what? It shows us our heart, right? God did not just do pass a parcel, you know? He didn't just say, oh, there's an angel. I don't need him. He rebelled. I'm going to send him to die on the cross. He sent his only 
begotten Son, born in the most humble way, that none of us would want our children to be like that. Some would pray and pray for private treatments. Don't be selfish. It says, be humble. Think of others better than yourself. Now, this is interesting. Now, there are sometimes, there are certain things now. I, I'm, I'm sure, I, I'm telling you, I know how to do this. This statement goes against that. Think of others. No matter who they are, there is no condition. There are no brackets there. Only if they are your leaders, or only if they are your pastors, or only if they are elders in the church, or only if they are, are leading you in some direction, they have authority over you, then think of themselves as better than yourself. No, it says, everyone, think of others better than yourself. Simple as that. Do we? Do we really think of others better than ourselves? Do we really think, no, no, he's a better, but in our hearts, sometimes, no, 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 I dress better. Trust me, I can kill it, you know? <laughs> we have things in our hearts, in our minds, and that's where humility needs to take place. Not just in our outward appearance, you know? You meet someone, yes sir, yes sir, very, looking very nice, but you know, you walk away. You know. Come on. Think of others better than yourself. Even if you are right. Even if you are better, Still, think of others as better than yourself. Come on, that's a profound statement. I don't think so that most people practice that. I don't think so. I don't know about you. I don't think so. I don't always do that. I'm being honest to you. And I want God to work this into my life. Do you? Don't look out for your own interest, but the interest of others. So basically, that's what it means. Don't look for your, just your interest. What am I gonna wear? Well, why don't you think about others? What he or she is gonna wear? Has she got money for Christmas? Has she got food on her table? Has he got somebody to look after the children because he's a single dad? What is happening in that person's life? Or am I just too wound up in my own Christmas preparations and in my own life and what I'm going to get and what I'm going to achieve that I don't even consider the interests of my fellow believer. If you can't love the person you see, how can you love God? In verse 5 it says this, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. This is mind blowing for me. Because I tell you, I was I received an email today out of the room from somebody I know, and they said, I'm writing this article, look at this statement, what do you think about it? The guy has no idea what I'm preaching. You know. And he said to me, I've, I've written this, that I said to somebody that we need to be more like Jesus. And the person said to me that, well, if I become more like Jesus, I, I won't be able to do anything. I won't be able to do anything because that person isn't very close to Jesus. Some of us really would not be able to say or do anything if we tried to be like Jesus. But really, this is, it all comes down to the fact that we need to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. You see, God doesn't just demand anything in the scriptures that he himself hasn't experienced. Right? Is that sitting well with you? God just doesn't demand anything in the scriptures that he himself has not experienced. Because in Christ Jesus, he experienced everything in this world. See, he can't tell us to have the same attitude as Christ Jesus if it was impossible to have. He can't tell us to don't be selfish. He can't tell us, don't look at just your own interests, but look at the interests of others. He can't tell us to be humble if he himself hasn't been humbled. Because the preceding verses puts it very well for us. He said instead he gave up his divine privileges. Go back to verse 6. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling on to. Humbleness is to give up your status and your position when circumstances demand it. Amen. It is to come down from your place of exaltation, the place where you are positioned, in order to serve the kingdom of God. 
humble as is to lower yourself right to the point of a slave. Because Jesus himself did it. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble, humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. Humbleness is downgrading yourself from an upgraded place. We all love flight upgrades. I've had some in the past. I tell you, they're great. You enjoy the business class, wow. Who would give up their flight upgrade and give it to somebody else? That's what humility exactly is. That's exactly what it is. No, 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 man, I can't do that. It's too, too low me. That's too below me. You know, Jesus, he proved that he could be humble. That he was humble. And he said this in John 13, verses 12 to 17. After washing, their feet. He put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I'm doing? Let me ask you, do we understand what Jesus did? <coughs> he asked his, do you, do you actually understand what I've just done? I've washed your feet. We sat down for a dinner. The job of a slave, I've done it for you. Do you understand what I've done? He wanted to make sure that they got that point. You call me teacher and Lord and yes, you're right. Because that's what I am. And since I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as you have done, as I've done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the messenger. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for them. Really, that's... It can't get better than this. That Jesus himself showed us an example. You know, so often we focus on practicing the power of Jesus. Right? Now on the power, man, come on. In the name of Jesus, walk. That's what I want. Come on. Can we practice washing of the feet? With the same passion. Amen. Somebody had a brilliant idea and said, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we've got to do this on the streets. And I tell you, strangers, non-Christians passing by, we washed their feet. I wasn't there, but the team out there on that night washed the feet of strangers walking on the streets of Victoria on Friday night. Some were emotionally touched. I said, who are you guys? Just washing feet of the people on the street? That's the attitude, that's humility. That's humbleness. That nothing is below me, nothing is, is, is too little for me to do. Being a leader is to humble ourselves and serve others. Leadership is not simply leading others, leading others, but in fact is serving others. Now we have a church discipleship training program. The core values of the discipleship training program are Humility and servant heartedness. I've been to university for theology. I've done my, my training with the Assemblies of God. But I tell you, these are two of the best things you can experience in the world. University and a, and a big denomination or nation to them. But I tell you, what we have, God-given structure in our church, you are not going to find it anywhere else. I promise you. And what we learn and what I walked away from there, from the church leadership training, what I embedded in myself, what I learned from there, I have not learned anywhere else. You see, God don't just ask you to serve tea and coffee for the sake of serving tea and coffee. Trust me, there are many people who would love to just do that every Sunday. We want to spread the opportunity. Why? Because Jesus himself said, learn. Learn from me. From humble at heart. Humility is something that God cannot force upon each and every one of us. That is why it isn't a fruit, a simple fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because He won't force you to be humble if you don't want to be humble. He's not going to give it to you if you don't desire something. So if I don't want to be humble, He's not going to make me humble. 
It is something that I've got to practice. It is something that I've got to learn. It is something that I need to embed in myself by being on that door, by ushering people in the kingdom of God, by serving tea and coffee, by cleaning the toilets, by doing whatever the kingdom of God requires me to do. Nothing is too hard or too little or too below me. Nothing displeases me. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. I love it. That's where I want to be. And that is what God is trying to teach us from that. Two simple words, manger and Bethlehem. There is a savior of the world could choose to be born in the way that no one ever would imagine. And he did not even need to be born that way. We established it ourselves today. He did not need to be born that way, yet he did. There is a reason behind it. That I may decrease and he must increase. That I may do whatever is needed in the kingdom. Whether I must. Executive Lodge, right? Um, Stanley was with us. Pascali Executive Lodge. The name is so executive. We said, I'm staying in Pascali Executive Lodge. He started laughing. He said, No, no, you're not. I said, No, I am. He said, No, you're not. I said, Look, I'll show you the booking. I am staying there. He said, Look, nobody stays there. No tourist goes into that area because that's a downtown, that's a township, that's a ghetto. And we were there and Pastor Mike was talking and they said, you know, how's this area? He asked at the reception and said, well, the last guard who was used to be on duty got uh, killed or murdered uh, by people in the area. Last month, we said, all right, that answers all the questions. People came to visit us and then trust, trust me, they were humbled by seeing us in that place. Told us, you know, on the signal, 
What will you say? Not because we can't afford to have the bank approach. We can, but we want to relate to the people. It's a very good story. I want to share this story about eating. You know, I was, after on my fifth trip to Malawi, I said, eventually, I'm going to ask the pastor. We've got a good friendship now. I'm going to ask him. I said, Pastor, look, you, know, you know me. I've been coming for a few years, so I'm establishing ground. Look, I have no problem. You know, I, we just need me and pastor. We just need whatever. I just want to ask you that, you know, you said that they, every time they slaughter a lamb and they do the, the meat of the goat and everything, but, you know, in the room, we always only see, like, the, the spare parts, like, the, Awful and the kidneys and the hearts and, and the feet and bring where's the meat? I said, you know, after five years, I'm, I'm fifth or sorry, fifth mission. I should be able to ask that. It should be okay now. He said, my brother, the meat's with the people outside. All the common people, the congregation, they are eating the meat. I said, Pastor, I'm going to eat with them. I don't want the special food. I don't want the chief's portion. You know, but we do it. We do it. We share the cups and the plates and the cutlery with the animals. We do it because we want nothing to hinder the work of the gospel. The moment we set ourselves and we say, oh, I can't eat that, I tell you, they will tell you themselves that you're not the mission you expected. And this pastor in Sun said to me, he said, one thing that touches us more than anything else about you guys is that you eat whatever we eat in the most remote parts. Where food poisoning can just get to you like that, you just do it. You take the risks because you want to relate to people. That's humility. You got to learn it. You got to embed it in yourself. We need that humility in each and every one of us. Amen. In in Philippians, same chapter, verse eight, he said, "He humbled himself in obedience to." Died a criminal step. Humbleness is doing what you're not even supposed to do or asked to do, like a said man. God did not have to save you and me. It's not, it wasn't his responsibility. It may sound like a contradictory, but it wasn't. He gave eternal life right from the beginning. Am I right? To Adam and Eve, here's the garden, go for it. Everything is yours. It's just told me from the tree. You know the story. Mankind broke that. What would have said, well, fine, if I give them a chance, I created humanity, they messed up, this is it, I'm not having anything more to do. Yet, he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you. He did not have. To humble himself. Christ did not have to come and die for you. He chose to die for you and for me. This is why we can't take the gift of salvation for granted. This is why we can't say, well, you know, well, God, you created the heaven and earth. So you, you, your plan had a bit of a flaw in it. So you had to do it. This isn't once saved, always saved. It isn't the way. It isn't what God invented. He chose to come down and die for you and for me. He chose it. He humbled himself. <laughs> would you, would I humble ourselves for him? Would you choose to do the same for Jesus? Peter 5 verse 5 to 6 says, In the same way you are younger, must accept the authority of elders, and all of you dress yourself in humility. Dress yourself in humility. What's happened to the church? Sometimes I don't understand. If it's not my way, it's no one's way. Arguments, negativity, picking on each other, criticizing each other, being selfish. Come on. What's happened to the church of Jesus Christ? Where do we get that spirit from? If each and every one of us were just humble, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be different. Do you know why? Because humility comes with reward. We don't seek it. We don't humble ourselves so that I can be exalted. We don't humble ourselves so people can see me doing things. We don't humble ourselves for the wrong reasons. We humble ourselves because we love. Love has to be the motivation of our immunity. We humble
humble ourselves because we are completely and totally sold out for the kingdom of God. That is why we humble ourselves. We don't humble ourselves because I know the Bible says, if you humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, in due time He's going to exalt you. That's not the reason as to why I want to humble myself because I'm going to be exalted. That's just this promise. You do it for that reason, you're not going to get any. Am I right? You are not going anywhere with that humbleness. Which is to show people. Yes, yes, Pastor Mike is asking me, but when he's not around, you don't turn up to church. Come. This serving is an opportunity which we should embrace without questioning and complaining. And with a good heart. With a good heart. Jesus said, I'm humble at heart. See, we confuse humbleness and gentleness. Do you think John the Baptist was humble? Jesus himself said, there's no man greater than John the Baptist born of him. Yet, people went all the way out to River Jordan, and that's far, I've been there. All the way out of Jerusalem, to there, Samaria, to go and see John the Baptist, only be told off, scolded, Sworn at you, brood of vipers, who told you to run away from the rock? Man, what was so special about it? Florence, think about it. This guy, you go to see to see him, and he tells you off. You know, you would expect, like, you know, like Pastor Mike, yeah, Stephen, man, yeah, no lifestyle. Come, let me pray for you. You, brood of repent right now, get into it. The guy was telling people off, yet. People ran to him. Why? It got nothing to do with your language or politeness or gentleness. Can you see the evidence there? It got something to do with, I must decrease and he must increase. Moses, the Bible says he was the humblest of the man, right? I can give you the scripture. It's, it's, it's there. Numbers 12 verse 3. It says now Moses was very humble, more humble than any other person on earth. Right? He killed an Egyptian. He won. Come on. People got angry. You want war? Come! There is the war. God said, man, he got angry. Yet when it was time that God said to Moses, I'm going to annihilate you. And he fell on his knees. He said, annihilate me too. Kill me too, Lord. That's what would people say. God brought them out with his outstretched arm and completed the work. When it was time, because he was humble in his heart. Never judge a man's motives. You can judge someone's action, but never, ever judge what they are thinking or what their motives are. You can never do that. From the outside, both of these people. Tall and fat or whatever. 
It doesn't matter. It's not about me being looking good and being in a nice and a comfortable place. It doesn't matter. What matters is that whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it unto the Lord. It doesn't matter when I dance in front of the people and some find it awkward, but I'm doing it for the Lord. It doesn't matter when I stand on that door and usher people in and people abuse me or, or, or swear at me or whatever in their hearts. And it doesn't matter because I'm doing it unto the Lord. It doesn't matter if I make mistakes, I serve on the visuals. I'm not doing it for the people. I'm doing it for the Lord. It doesn't matter how I sound on that mic or how I play the keyboard because I'm doing it for the Lord. It doesn't matter how I look on the outward. What matters is how I am inward. It doesn't matter where I am placed physically, but what matters is where I am spiritually. It doesn't matter how high I am or what titles two people may put me on. What matters is how low I can go for the kingdom of God. That is humility. We all need that. None of us are exempt of that. I want you to stand up with me. I'll give you something to chew on for those who like to study the Bible. <coughs> I said humility comes with a word. Jesus could do that. How much more I should do? 